Yes, all right. So I was already introduced and I won't repeat it myself, uh, but let me tell you a bit about ML6. We are a machine learning services company and we help our clients build machine learning applications using technologies such as, but not limited to, Apache Beam. Now, if we look back at the title, there's basically two different things that we want to do with uh, textual data and using Apache Beam for it. One is semantic enrichment. And by this, we basically mean the process of adding semantic information to the text document for downstream tasks. So we are not talking about replacing any kind of um, content, but rather just adding information to the document that we can then use in uh, downstream tasks. The second part is the online clustering, which just means that we want to arrange the documents into not yet defined uh, groups as they come in. And as they come in, that is basically the online part of this. Now I tried to um, illustrate this here on the right hand side. We might have different sources. This can be databases. This can be servers that are producing documents or, uh, for, for example, user generated content through social media and so on and so forth. Anyway, we have a lot of different sources. We have text documents. Then something happens with them, the semantic enrichment and the online clustering. And then we end up with documents which are more semantically enriched and they are grouped into certain groups, but we don't know the groups uh, beforehand. <laughs> Now, if we look at semantic enrichment, this can be a very simple pipeline, as we see here on the top right corner. So we just take a document, do something to it. It gets a bit more semantically enriched. We do that again and then and so on and so forth. So it's not a one time operation that we do, but it's just a normal uh, transformation that we might integrate into any of our beam pipelines that we already have. And I tried to uh, collect here a couple of examples for semantic enrichment, and we will go through it shortly. But let me uh, say, what do we mean by semantic enrichment? I would say the semanticity of this enrichment that's really on a scale. So it's not that some, um, some enrichments are semantic and some others are not. There are certainly instances of enrichments which are not semantic, but it's not that it's a yes or no, but rather this can be on a scale. Some are more and some are less <coughs> semantically enriching the content. Then if we start, we have a couple of very easy ones. So for example, we have a document and we just want to count the uh, word occurrences. We might have, um, uh, we, we might want to add information about the geo uh, ge geolocations for any kind of region or city or country or anything that we encounter in our textual documents. We might want to categorize our documents. So that means adding predefined labels to them. We might want to do sentiment analysis. We, want to, we might want to filter out profanity. If we have an online platform and we want to keep it clean, then we want to maybe identify profanity, remove it such that uh, this doesn't end up on our platform. We might want to extract keywords. So we have a text and there are certain words which already give the basic meaning of the text. So we might want to do this. Similarly, we might want to do uh, named entity recognition or building on this, not only having the named entities recognized, but also linking these named entities, for example, to an external knowledge base, and then using this external knowledge base to uh, yeah, add even more information for these named entities which appear in our text. Maybe we have very long documents and we want to summarize this to then serve, for example, as teaser text in a news uh, application or something like this. We might have words, sentences, or entire documents. So words, for example, from the named entities or also from the keyword extraction. And then we want to have embeddings to then do operations like uh, calculating or finding similarities, uh, similar, um, similar content between these. So for example, uh, uh, comparing two documents and finding out if they are very similar to one another, then maybe we can group them together later. Maybe we don't start out with a machine readable content already. So we might have to do OCR first and maybe we need to do some kind of OCR correction. Maybe we have only uh, text in a certain language and we actually want to serve a variety of different countries where other languages are spoken. So we might need to do translations and add this also to just the documents that our documents are more usable for other use cases as well. And we might want to do this the last example here, co-reference resolution and I think this one is um, is uh, giving you some kind of uh, intuition that basically with semantic enrichment, we can do any kind of uh, linguistic application uh, that, we, that we can think of. All right, so let's uh, see a bit more detail how we actually do this. Uh, so there's a couple of examples. We start out with the very first one. So we just want to count the, the words in our text document. How do we do this? 
It's a simple custom uh, do function. We just have one process method. We take an element, we get the text from it, we split the text on white space to get the words. We count the words, very simple. Now, if we look at the other examples here, so for example, sentiment analysis, named entity recognition, summarization, embeddings, and so on, translation, and so on and so forth, these uh, operations are less straightforward and simple, such that we can implement the logic just in a method. Rather, we need to implement or use um, machine learning models, and these machine learning models can be very large. So we need to find some kind of method how we can handle this as well using Apache Beam. Now, one very naive way of doing it is uh, another example of a very uh, simple custom uh, do function. We again have the process where we take the text and then we do one more step, namely the embedding. And here we would just uh, very naively load the model in each instantiation of this embedding function, uh, load the model, uh, get the embedding, and add this to our output. Now, you might, of course, already see, and I think we have seen it throughout the conference already a couple of times, that this is probably not the best way to do it because in each instantiation, we would need to load the model, which can be very large. We are talking here about multiple gigabytes of data. So one alternative would be to uh, utilize the, the setup function to only load the model once there for each uh, instance of, uh, for each instance only once, so then it can be reused uh, between, between uh, bundles. And as long as the uh, instance is basically active. Um, yeah, sometimes we, this might not be ideal for all the use cases still. So then we might want to host our model either in uh, on a GCP, for example, in Vertex AI or any kind of other microservice, which is appropriate uh, place to host our machine learning models. Um, and then our, uh, yeah, our um, custom uh, do function would just uh, contain the call to this particular model. And then we uh, get the embedding and save this back as well. And similarly for already what we saw uh, by using the uh, setup function, we can do it here as well. So if we have a lot of requests coming into our uh, microservices, we might want to uh, instantiate the session also in the setup. And very excited, very new um, is of course also the run inference now, which makes it way easier without needing, without the need um, to go to, for example, microservices and so on and so forth. And rather we can uh, do machine learning things way easier in FFG. Uh, beam already. If you want to know more about this, I invite you to check out Andy's talk from yesterday because that uh, was really great and contains a lot more information. Also with some um, machine learning patterns like A-B testing of, the mo of models as well as cascading uh, um, of machine learning models. All right. So now we have seen a couple of examples what we can, uh, what we mean by semantic enrichment. And we also have seen already a couple of examples how we can do this. And uh, how does this fit now in our, our model? I've already tried to motivate this in the beginning a bit. So the enrichment step, we can see it here on the, we can see a couple here in our uh, pipeline graph, but we also can see they are different, right? So some of them are just simple um, transformations. Others require the call, for example, to a microservice and so on. And Apache Beam, in a way, is a really nice way to integrate this into other workflows because we have all these great tools, right? We can have batching pipelines, streaming pipelines. We can do filtering, grouping, windowing, all these things would make, which make it very easy to work uh, with pipelines. And we can also integrate our semantic enrichment steps into this. All right. So this was basically an overview of the semantic uh, enrichment. And now we're going to online clustering. Again, online clustering, what does it mean? Arranging documents into not yet defined groups as they come in. And I tried to visualize this here uh, as well. So now we uh, don't have gray boxes, but rather colorful ones. So they are already semantically enriched. And we want to go from this uh, group of elements to the right-hand side where we see, okay, these are like uh, one, home, one group of elements into multiple groups of elements. And we already saw as well that one of these semantic enrichment steps was this uh, embedding. So for example, what does it mean? If we say we, um, in the following, um, consider uh, using embeddings for the entire text, this just means that uh, we don't want to use the text, but rather we want to have a numerical representation that is often just an array of values uh, 
representing a vector in a high dimensional vector space and the uh, direction of this vector basically gives uh, some indication of the semantic meaning of this particular text. And if we say high dimensional vector space, that's often very difficult to visualize. So let's uh, stick to two dimensions uh, here. And in this way, we can basically uh, represent our documents in a two dimensional way, way. And if we then want to do clustering on this, that generally involves calculating the distance between all the different elements. And if we do this, then we can uh, take all these distances and arrange them in some kind of distance matrix. And then from this distance matrix, do the clustering. Of course, this is not a great fit for Apache Beam, and especially if we talk here about this online clustering, because we don't want to wait until all the elements that we might have arrived. Rather, we want to process them one by one as soon as they come in and already do some kind of clustering and refine this clustering as we go. Now, one example of a uh, clustering algorithm is, for example, agglomerated clustering. How do we do this? We already have this distance matrix. We just represent each of the documents as a, uh, as a leaf node. Then we take the two uh, leaf nodes or the two. So each leaf node represents a cluster with a single element. Then we take the, uh, the subclusters that we already have. In the first step, this would be only the leaf nodes. We take the two which are closest together we link them and get another subcluster, which then contains the two uh, yeah, subclusters that we just merged into one. And we pro progress until we reach uh, the, the, the root node. And now the interesting fact here is that the leaf nodes contain single documents and the root node contains one cluster, which contains all the documents. And then if we... Um, if we say, all right, but this doesn't help us because either we have all the documents or only the single documents. So then we can say, if we know the number of clusters that we, that we desire, we can just cut the tree at that particular height. And then we end up with these, with this particular number of clusters. Or alternatively, if we don't know the number of clusters, we can set some kind of threshold and say either, okay, clusters can only be this or that large, or need to, the clusters need to be this or that far from uh, one another. So to summarize, clustering is usually a batch operation, but we're talking about online clustering, so we want to do it as we go. So what do we need to do? So what do we need to make this uh, happen? There's two ingredients. The first one is some kind of clustering algorithm that works iteratively. Uh, and by iteratively, because the agglomerative clustering algorithm, the tree structure is also built iteratively, but each clustering decision where to insert or how to uh, basically merge uh, subclusters involves knowing all the elements already up front. And the second part is some kind of way to store this intermediate representation of our tree structure, so some way or mechanism to access, to, uh, access a previous state. Luckily for us, there is one clustering algorithm which uh, exactly fits our bill here, which is called Birch. And I try to summarize how this algorithm works um, on this one slide, also in contrast with the uh, agglomerative clustering. And we already see some kind of similarity. Both of them have some kind of tree structure, but there's also certain differences. So we see, for example, that the leaf nodes, so the leaves on the very top in the Birch algorithm, they are sometimes a bit bigger, and this should represent that they don't contain only a single element, but rather already summaries of multiple elements. And all the, um, all the intermediate nodes also contain summaries. Now, what do we mean by summaries? This is just a tuple of three elements, which gives the summary. And this is very simple. It's only two numbers and one vector. The first number is the number of elements in that particular um, summary. The second one is just the linear sum of all the elements that we have seen so far. And the third one is just the, the squared sum of the, basically the length of all the elements that we have already seen. And then by just having these very simple summaries, two numbers, one vector, we can calculate a lot of interesting things. So for example, the centroid of the summaries that, or of the subclusters that we already have. 
we can calculate it by just using these three measures. Similarly, two other, uh, two other uh, metrics for a single subcluster called one, the radius, and the other one is the diameter. Now the radius is basically just the average distance from all the points to the centroid and the diameter is the average distance between all the different points. And we can calculate this again, just from the summary. Similarly, now this was on a single subcluster. If we have two subclusters, we can calculate uh, certain distances, uh, D0 to D4. D0 is just the Euclidean distance. D1 is the Manhattan distance. D2 is the intercluster distance. D3 is the intracluster distance. And D4 is some kind of average variance or something like this. Doesn't really matter, again, only from these summaries. We can calculate all these distances, and that's pretty amazing. Now, in addition, if we need to update a summary, we have this additive theorem, which basically states that the summary of two summaries, so the combination of two summaries, is just always the sum of these three elements that we have. All right. So let's go through a couple of examples of how to insert a node into our tree using Birch. And we start out with this tree structure already given, and now we want to insert this uh, node here in gray. How do we do this? We start from the root node and always decide to pick the one uh, summary node which is closest using one of the five distances that we have. So in our case here, this is the green one. So we go to the left, we do the same thing again. We go again to the left, so we end up with the blue one. And then we have two choices of what to do. Either we can add this new element to the leaf node if the resulting subcluster is below a certain threshold. So the, the diameter or the radius is below a certain threshold. And this already gives us some kind of indication of that the tightness of these subclusters in the leaf nodes plays a very important role. So if they are tight enough, uh, small enough, then we don't store the separate uh, documents, but rather we only s uh, store this kind of summary. And in a way, we already, from this, get some kind of localized clustering. So if it's local, close enough together, then we don't care about the uh, separate documents. We only save the summary. All right, this is one way to do it. Now, in the top, this was successful. We could just uh, add our element into this summary already. On the bottom, on the other hand, we were not, succe not, not successful. And then what we do is we just introduce another leaf node, which is a subcluster containing, in our case here, only a single element. But this one can, of course, also grow and be a summary uh, of itself in the future. Now, here's a second example of how this um, tree structure is uh, built. Turns out we were actually wrong. So we should have gone to the right-hand side to the orange one. We do it. We, again, pick the next node, which is closest. And then we end up with the node on the very far uh, side of, of uh, the tree structure. And there, again, we have uh, two different choices of what we want to do. One is, uh, again, we can simply add our element to the summary that already exists and just need to update our summary. And then also, of course, all the summaries um, in the tree structure further up. Or if it's not the case, we would need to add again one more no one, one leaf node. Now it turns out there's on the right-hand side, we already have three leaf nodes, so it's not possible, which means that we need to introduce two, no, two new uh, subclusters and for each of these new subclusters, the two nodes from the previous subcluster that are farthest away from one another, these ones are the seeds for the uh, child nodes. And then we basically reintroduce the, uh, the other nodes that we still have. The details don't really matter. The most important point here is really that we have these summaries. They are quite amazing. And we have this localized subclustering already. So if it's, if it's close enough, we only store the summaries. We don't care about the single uh, separate documents. <clears throat> All right. Let's summarize what we just learned about Birch. It adds documents iteratively. We built a tree structure that contains summaries of subclusters. 
And these summaries are sufficient for all the clustering decisions in contrast with the agglomerative clustering algorithm where we need to know all the documents to make any kind of clustering decision. Tight local subclusters are summarized. This algorithm is very fast. We only need to read the input data once. So it's of O of N. Uh, the resulting summaries can be used as input to other clustering algorithms. So maybe we end up with a clustering here that is not optimal, then we can do some reweighting, or we can just say, okay, we take the, this, um, the, the, the clustering that we already have with this localized subclustering, and then use that one as the basis for other uh, clustering algorithms. All right, so the first ingredient that we need for online clustering, done. A clustering algorithm that works iteratively. Next, we need some kind of mechanism to access the previous state. And we have seen this throughout the com uh, conference already a couple of times. And I would, if you want to know more, I would invite you to the talk uh, about caching with Apache Beam, which contains uh, not only these methods, but a couple of other ones as well. And that's, I think, a great learning resource as well. Now, stateful processing is the thing that we need to access the previous state. Here's three examples. On the left-hand side, we can see we really do just um, element-wise processing. So we take one document, count the words, output the number of words, and that's done. But what if we want to do the average to the, the difference to the average of the words in all the documents? We could do some kind of windowing. Now, these can be uh, non-overlapping or overlapping. But uh, the key point here is that the uh, windows, is it's basically always bound, right? So we cannot... Uh, calculate the average number of words for the documents that we have seen until all eternity. If we want to do that, then what we need, or one way to do it at least, is uh, the state. So with this, we can have some kind of running average. And it's very simple, right? So um, we only need to store, the in this example, the total number of words that we have seen and the number of documents. From this, we can calculate the average. And then the dis difference to this average from all the documents that we introduce new, we can calculate this basically running average. And since it's just numbers that we store, we can uh, do this forever if we please. Now the state uh, has different colors, which means that uh, there are some limitations or not necessarily limitations, but certain things that you need to do, keep in mind. Uh, do you always uh, associate the state with a key as well as uh, a window? All right, now this is a code example of how to do this stateful processing. I will quickly go over this. On the left-hand side, you can see here the, uh, the pipeline. So we just have very simple uh, uh, processing steps, but it's very uh, analogous to the enrichment of basically building the, um, the, the document um, embeddings and then doing online clustering, uh, which would also use the, the state. So what do we do? We just uh, read the documents. We do some kind of enrichment here. It's just counting the words. Then we uh, make uh, key value pairs out of our elements. Then we do the stateful average difference uh, processing step, and then we can output our things. On the right-hand side, you can see the do functions. The first one is just counting the words. The other one is a bit more interesting. How does it work with stateful processing? We define to um, state specifications, one for the number of documents that we have seen and one for the, num the total number of words. And we also need to provide some kind of serialization method here. It's a pickle coder, uh, which is probably not the most optimal in this use case, but it very much translates well to using these, uh, yeah, th this uh, kind of serialization for our clustering use case actually. And then if we use this, we basically always have um, four steps. So the first one is if we run the, uh, this method the first time, we initialize, or otherwise, if we've run it already, uh, load the state. We modify the state. So in our case, that would mean increment the number of documents that we have seen by one, add the new number of um, words that we have seen so far to our running count, and calculate the difference, write the state back, so saving what we just modified, and then yield the element. All right, online clustering. Uh, the two ingredients that we needed. A clustering algorithm that works iteratively. Birch, great, we have it. Stateful processing, so some mechanism to access the previous state. We have this as well. Let, let's uh, go from there. So 
So now bring these together again with the semantic enrichment. And I want to uh, go through an example using the pipeline that you can see here. So semantic enrichment and online clustering of textual data using Apache, Apache Bean. Suppose we have um, six text documents. Uh, Star Wars is my favorite movie. I reject the later edits. Clearly, Han Solo shot first. I like turtles. July could be the first month with no measurable rain in Austin since 2015. Star Trek is an awesome series. Or dry conditions, low humidity, and breezy winds will allow any fires to spread rapidly. This is basically representing already the documents that we have, but they are quite bland. So uh, we see this here as these uh, gray boxes. Then the first step that we would do is use any of the uh, yeah, semantic enrichment steps that we have seen that calls a machine learning model to um, get the vector representation. So uh, the text uh, embedding of uh, our textual documents. And we can see this here again uh, represented as these vectors pointing into different directions. And also the vectors are differently long, right? All right, next step uh, that we need to do here is to normalize our uh, embeddings. So that just means put, uh, making all the vectors that we have unit length. Because in general, if we talk about text embedding, um, then we are more interested in the direction of the vectors representing the text instead of the length. Uh, so usually if you, don't need, if you don't normalize it, you would use the uh, cosine distance to calculate the similarity between textual uh, embeddings, but if you normalize them, then it's proportional, so we don't need to uh, use the cosine embedding, and that's quite nice because generally for the Birch algorithm, we always use the Euclidean distance. Then next up is the clustering step that we left out for now, and uh, I will just go through this example now. So one thing that I need to mention before is the getting the embedding, so the um, the text embedding as well as the normalization, this can uh, be run in parallel, parallel, but now the clustering step will be uh, run sequentially. So we introduce the first um, document. Now on the in the middle, you can always see the uh, tree that we are building. And on the right-hand side, you see uh, on the one hand how the clustering looks like, as well as uh, some kind of output that gives the uh, update of what just happened. And uh, for each cluster that was either uh, generated or updated which documents are contained in this one. So we start out with nothing. So we add the first text document, then we get a new uh, cluster. And this uh, cluster has a certain label. And then the only document in it is the one about Star Wars. And we take the second document. Now these two documents were very close to one another. So we can merge them into this uh, summary in our tree. And we have the clustering of these uh, of a single cluster containing two of these documents. Then we introduce the next one. These are uh, less similar, so we introduce a new node. We have two clusters now, the, the one from before as well as a new one. Um, we do it for the, third doc the fourth document, sorry. Uh, introduce another new cluster. Then we do it for the fifth document. This one is, again, closer to the first two documents, so uh, we update the cluster that we had from the beginning. And lastly, we introduce uh, the last uh, document and that one also can be merged into one of the uh, summaries for, uh, for, um, for one of our clusters. All right, so let's uh, summarize what we have seen uh, today. So on the one hand, semantic enrichment is uh, the process of adding information to the content of the documents. And this, uh, what we get out of is already contained in the documents. It's just not accessible. Uh, this often involves machine learning. Uh, uh, which are expensive operations. Then we saw this online clustering, which allows the grouping of uh, text documents into groups that are unknown upfront in real time. For this, we use the stateful processing, which enables iterative uh, model building of our clustering tree. And then Birch um, is an iterative clustering algorithm that can handle very large amounts of data. Now, lastly, if we want to do this in real time, so bringing this to production, this of course would be a streaming pipeline. For the enrichment, we would want to serve the machine learning models either through microservices. Uh, and then we need to make sure that, for example, we initialize the connection in the setup 
uh, of the do function, one thing that we can also add, which is a nice feature, is to use uh, time batch uh, requests. So basically waiting until you have enough documents such that you don't uh, do too many requests to the microservice. And of course, uh, the run inference is, I think, very interesting to, to integrate into these workflows as well. And for the clustering, now uh, maybe the, the Birch algorithm is very, um, very efficient, but the model that we built might still get very large. So it might be useful in some use cases that we then tidy up uh, the state once in a while by pruning, for example, outdated uh, elements. And uh, this brings me to the Q&A. Thank you.